<laughs> okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Peter Thomas. <laughs> Well, that's the question. Yeah, I'm going to take my coat off too. That, that's the question I asked earlier, and basically it was just trying for me to get a sense of how much context to provide. I am going to provide some context on the war. Um, who are the players? First off, King Philip's War begins in June of 1675 in the colony of um, Plymouth and evolves there for the first few months and then it becomes essentially too hot in that area for the Wampanoag and the Nibmuk so they move into the Connecticut Valley, the bottomlands down there. They're probably running around up here too but we know nothing about it. So there are going to be essentially two campaigns that we're going to talk about. But who are the players? The war starts in this area. And you get the Wampanoag tribe here. Nipmuc is a term that refers to a number of upland communities that cover this entire area. But this is what starts it. At the beginning, the Narragansetts here are not part of it. The Pequot Mohegan, once the war begins, are allies of the, of the colony of Connecticut. And they fight on the English side. By the time the <coughs> war is fully engaged, you've got all the communities all the way up into here, the Pentecook up into New Hampshire, and eventually it spills over and goes all the way up into Maine. Um, it's essentially over by August of 76, the following year. Uh, King Philip is dead, uh, a number of the um, Indians surrender or are captured, and the war essentially is over here. So these are the, these are the tribes. And when we look at the valley, these are essentially the villages that people, where people, Indians here, were living um, in terms of the communities. Now, I already told you that Pocumtuck as a community and Squawkey really didn't exist as fortified as settlements anymore. <coughs> so they've consolidated down in here at Warren Oak, around Warren Oak, around Agawam, the <coughs> big settlement here. So that's the Indian communities. So on the English side, we have the Mass Bay Colony, Plymouth Colony, the Colony of Connecticut. <clears throat> these had united, grouped into a united colonies, and each of these during the war contributed troops depending upon the size of their own populations. So the Mass Bay uh, Colony contributed the majority of number of troops in almost any campaign. Then. Connecticut would have its proportion, Plymouth would have its proportion. Now let's look at this on the Connecticut side of the valley. And this is where we get back to, yeah, I know Conway didn't exist, but this was what essentially was here. Between Northfield and Springfield, we had about 310 families with a total population of this. That's about 150 feet, 150 people shy of Conway's population in 2010. The only thing that's really different is the demographics. In 1675, this was proportioned to about 400 men, 400 women, and the rest were kids. Families at that time were average eight kids per family, with anywhere from zero to 13 or 14. So when we talk about who's here, in terms of the English communities, taking the brunt of the Indian attacks, 
that's your total 1,700 residents scattered out in seven towns along 66 miles of the Connecticut River. Now, just as a contrast, that's the population for coastal Connecticut and Massachusetts, 40,000. We are really on the isolated fringe of the colony. So there's your breakdown. If you want to see it? I'm not going to read them all, but you know, Northfield, 16 men, 45 women and children. So when Northfield gets attacked, except for the troops that might come to help them out, that's the number of men there that were there to defend it. Northampton, 80 men, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that. When we think about King Philip's War, and we look at the scale of the, the number of people that are here, it's a really small war. I mean, the number of people that would get killed in the course of this war uh, in Syria, it, it took them three months. But nonetheless, it's a significant part of our history and the Native American history here in the valley. So, with that in mind, I talked a little bit earlier, but these are the two uh, events that I want to cover tonight. Uh, I'll give you a context to, to look at each of these in, but that's the, um, they're essentially, what, nine, nine months apart. So, when we look at King Philip's War, they really are two quite different wars. This is where it starts, and this is where it ends. But it starts here, and then moves this way into the valley. So, Brookfield gets attacked on the 1st of August, 1675. And then they keep, then they come in and move, and we'll talk about uh, some of the major uh, attacks that occurred here in the valley. And then there's a winter hiatus in which um, Philip and some of the Pocumtuck and Narragansetts go into New York to try and recruit troops here, and the Mohawk break them up. Uh, and then once it's finally over here in the valley, they kind of scoop back towards the east, and that's where it comes to a conclusion. But the number of people involved among the Narragansetts, for example, there were probably four to five thousand Narragansetts uh, down here. I don't think we hit for a thousand people in terms of the valley population, in terms of Native Americans, in all of the communities combined. So, here's some of the major events in, in the valley. Um, the first thing that they try and do in August of 75, the English settlers are uncomfortable that the Indians living, the Nowatic Indians living here uh, in the Hadley, Northampton area still have guns. So they send a party to uh, the fort and say, uh, we want you to surrender your guns. They do. A few days later, the English go out after some of Philip's people that are moving, starting to move up into the valley. And they think, well, wouldn't it be cool if we had some Indian scouts? So they gave them back their guns. And they joined them off scouting for Philip. The problem is that some of the Mohegans uh, from Uncas's group in Connecticut show up as well. And then they come back and they go, hey, guess what? Every time we get close to the enemy, one of your Nowaks gives them some kind of signal and they disappear. Oh, well, I guess we better get the guns back. So they 
told them that they wanted to, the guns to get back to the one of the leading men in the village says, well, we'll bring them back to you tomorrow. The guys are off in the field uh, hunting right now. And that night they take off. And the whole community, lock, stock, and barrel, except for one old guy that they knock on the head because he doesn't want any part of it, take off and they go up river and just south of Mount Sugarloaf is what they call Hopewell Swamp. And a contingent of uh, soldiers from Hadley in Northampton uh, chased them up uh, to Hopewell Swamp. There's an engagement. The English lose nine. We had no idea how many Indians get lost, uh, but they managed to escape. And then, well, North, Northfield gets burned to the ground. And they figure, well, all hell's going to break loose. We've already lost beer and company up there. So let's go get our stores of grain in Deerfield. Uh, we're not sure whether it's wheat or whether it's corn, but some kind of grain. We're going to load it on wagons and we're going to bring it back to Had Hadley. And so there's 18 wagons that go north to Deerfield, uh, driven by local Teamsters, uh, either Deerfield men themselves, some out in Northampton, uh, one from Hadley, and a couple uh, out of the forces of a Massachusetts Bay Colony um, under the command of Captain Lafer. And they go north to Deerfield, they load up the wagons, they come south, and this is the fatal day. At Muddy Brook in South Deerfield on the 18th of September. They're crossed, some of the wagons have crossed Muddy Brook, uh, come to the other side, and have basically stopped to rest. And 500 Indians attack them. There's, there's a company of Essex County Militia under Lathrop. Uh, these are mostly conscripts and some volunteers, 18 years old is the 21 is an average age for this group. Older people might be the officers and Lathrop I think was 65. But you can bet that they had very little military experience. Um, and within an hour, eight of that company had managed to escape somehow um, and made their way back to the English communities. Eventually, everybody else is dead. Um, except for one guy, I'll tell you about him in a minute, uh, who was hatcheted. And so they decide that the Indians are stripping the clothing, they're into the wagons, spilling the grain, anything else that's there. And a man and his company named Captain Mosley, who unlike the raw recruits that were in the initial company, Mosley was a former privateer um, attacking ships in the Caribbean. Um, John, is the pirate still among his group? No, they're all gone by then. Uh, well, it turns out. he might have had a he, couple of the privateers that he used to capture right. the pirates. Well, he had one, one <laughs> among his initial crew was a, a pirate that his, his choice was either hang or join Mosley. <laughs> so you get a sense of the character of Mosley's men. These guys were used to fighting. So Mosley shows up and starts to fight. The battle continues for another five hours. The Indians try to outflank him, and the battle gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then at the end of the day, a company under Captain Trait from Connecticut and 60 Mohegan Pequots show up, and they basically drive the Indians, the other Indians away. So that's the sort of the story 
and I'm going to pick it up from here. You, I put it on a on a map. This is a 1794 map, but you can see it's already labeled yeah. burial ground, Captain Lathrop, Sugarloaf down here. For you who know the territory, this is South uh, Main Street. This is North Main Street. This is Sugarloaf Street. This is the little. This is our village down there in, in town. So probably most of you have driven by this monument. Uh, but here's what it looks like from the air. This Frontier Regional High School. This is the stream crossing for Buddy Brook. The monument's here, and there's a memorial stone down here in the front yard. So there's a monument in 1909. That, that familiar to everybody? Yeah. And that's the house and that's the memorial stone. And as far as I can figure, it was placed over this grave or over the grave sometime between 1716 and 1720, before 1728. Um, Judge Sewell comes and visits the site and doesn't mention the, the memorial, but there is a, a visitor that comes to the site and registers the memorial in his diary. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, it says, Grave of Captain Lathrop and men slain by the Indians, 1675. This is probably something like this existed with this. This is described as a brick and stone monument. But the only thing that survives today is the large tabular stone in here. Um, this is an older picture, the, the one you just saw before. Uh, it's totally out of the ground right now and it's actually been repaired. This broken seam has been repaired. Um, when, when was the house built? That it's the house was built in 1806. Afterwards? Yes. Um, and part of the reason for this moving around is let me see what the next slide is and then we can go from there. All right. This is in the front yard, but where that house stands, it, it fronts um, North Main Street. That was the original trail from Deerfield to Hatfield. One of two. The other one began just towards the monument from that house that went cross lots to the southern end of Mount Sugarloaf. That road disappeared very early on. But there was actually a break in the trail coming south. And then once you got to the foot of Mount Sugarloaf, the southern tip of it, you picked up River Road, or what's now River Road, and you go down through Waitley to Hatfield. So there were two ways to go, and one of the reasons I think the Indians struck when they did is that if they'd waited any longer, they wouldn't have known whether the English were going by the river trail or by the trail straight south. Both of them had difficulties. These are unimproved roads. They're not roads. They're paths at best. And one of the difficulties with the wagons that are fully loaded like this is they weigh a considerable amount. You can bet that they got bogged down in, in Muddy Brook. But one of the things that we don't see today and don't observe is that that section of South Main Street in South Deerfield, it's, it's cut off by Route 116 that goes over to Amherst. It used to just go down a hole and, and continue on south. It's what they call the uh, Straits Road, Log Plain Road, but in the 19th century and in the 1600s, there were sand dunes all through there. And anybody trying to bring a loaded wagon <coughs> through that stretch of that road would get them bogged down in the sand dunes. So 
the, the landscape changes, folks. <laughs> um, did I answer your question? I can't even remember. Yeah, it was just the house was built later. Yeah, the house was built um, by a guy named Stephen Whitney, who was a local storekeeper. He actually came from New Hampshire, bought a fairly good sized plot of land down there, built the house in 1906, and was also one of the main drivers with Hoyt to put up the monument. So he was historically sensitive. Uh, he said, look, I need to, I want to put my house here, this marker's in the way, let's move it a little bit. And so he didn't build his house on top of the grave, but they did a little reorienting. <coughs> um, but that's caused confusion. Yeah. And then in later years, um, we tend to think of, okay, uh, by the 16, by the 1830s, things had settled down, it probably didn't change much, but it did. There was a streetcar that ran up Main Street. Um, in 1830, they talked about the grave and the stone being in the street. Well, there's a five rod right away in here, so it's 82 feet. So it's a pretty <coughs> wide street. So we're not sure exactly where in the street was. Um, in 1872, this stone was embedded in the sidewalk. Uh, so it's moved around, but it's still in the same general location, I believe. So this is what Bloody Brook might have looked something like this. This is actually Muddy Bloody Brook uh, today. It's pretty mucky in through here and then it comes down a slope like this and then across here. And that's the same way it uh, crossed in 1675. I don't know how many of you know Al Dre, um, long time local avid historian and, and graphic artist. This was his rendition of what the trail might have looked like uh, numbers of centuries ago. He's got a corduroy road in here. This is a, a log road when they put it put in to handle uh, vehicles. I think the corduroy is, is later. Uh, it's probably 18th century of some sort, but it gives you a much different sense than looking at the high school, which he's got represented back there. Um, but it's, it's a real different scene than what was there 340 years ago. So long and the short is we have, the crossings coming down, then the trails that I was telling you about, this is one of the trails that would have gone down here, the other one would have gone down there, and I think this is the one that they actually followed, um, or would have followed. Um, but by the time Mosley was through and Trait came into the scene, I think that battle field had expanded from here all the way down into here all the way along Muddy Brook. And there's some talk about a battlefield study for this one as well. And so with, there may be metal detectors and you know, try to see if there's any remnants. Now, there's other things that's involved here and for the sake of time, I need to be pretty quick, but they talk about one burial, one mass grave. Cotton Mather talks about 60 people in a single grave. Imagine the size of a hole, put 60 people in. Yeah, you're probably looking at about the size of this audience. This is no small grave. So, but then there's an, an old um, um, fellow from Waitley who actually told them how to, where to find that grave. And they dug into it, and they in fact found bones. So it exists. But, and if you look at um, Hoyt's sketchbooks, he says it's 20 feet northwest of the front door of the house, which puts it under this humongous maple tree. So, but then we also learn from Hoyt 
that this same person that told him where this grave was comes up to him and says, hey, there's another one. He says, I'll show you. Then they go off. Does Hoyt write it down? Oh, no. no. So we don't know where it is, but it's somewhere. Within a month, somebody's reporting that, oh, they found the Indian mass grave. And that's supposed to be over about where in here. And they even give the number, 96. I'm sitting there, I, you know, there's no way Somebody's gone through and counted 96 Indians in a mass grave 130 years after. And where the devil did 96 came from? It's what Increase Mather wrote in 1677 as the presumed number of Indian dead after Bloody Brother. So we'll take that with a grain of salt. But anyway, we have reports of three graves. And. Um, so we may do a little further exploration, just I'm not about to go digging into it, but we'll, we'll see. There's a ground penetrating radar that we may give a try to. But anyway, that's the... Is that uh, suspected Indian mass grave underneath the Frontier Athletic Field? Uh, no. Um, this would be the athletic field out here. And it's across the, it's across the road. This is, uh, this is I-91. This is five and ten. So the fire stations are out here. And uh, so we're over. There's a, there's a little brook that runs down through here. Yeah, right by Conway Road, right in the pumpkin patch. What's the red dotted line? The red dotted line, um, if you've read David Gracie's Standing on history, this was his proposed Pocumpta Trail and where the Bloody Book Massacre mm -hmm. took place. And part of the reason I wrote another article is to disagree with him. Yeah. Okay. But there is a there is an old what's what's interesting though is that there is an old trail over here. I've actually walked part of it. Um, but who knows what it is? I mean, it's come, it could be logging roads, go farm roads. I mean, it's it, there are definite depressions and openings through the woods that go for quite a long distance. Okay, so consequences of Muddy Brook. We've got 70 English killed. Lathrop and uh, his troop from Essex. Um, we've got 17 Teamsters dead. One living, um, one actually escapes and um, makes it back to Hatfield. And then 11 of Captain Mosley's company, and then Mather reports 96 Indians killed. And John and I someday will eventually agree on the exact numbers, but <laughs> we're going back and forth. So. But here's the repercussions of the 32 men known to have settled in Deerfield in 1675. 14 were now dead. These were the Teamsters. We had eight widows and 44 fatherless children in one morning. And in less than two weeks, the, the Deerfield was abandoned and people took up shelter in Hatfield, Hadley, Northampton and sometimes further on a field. Think of the people and the size of the houses that were in North, in Hatfield and Hadley and Northampton. Now we're moving in 33, the remains of 33 families. And very soon we're going to have a whole bunch of Massachusetts troops garrisoned in the houses too. It's going to get pretty cramped. So this is in the fall, early fall of 1675. And I'm, the, the transition here to get us into the next year, the Great Swamp Fight 
occurs in southern uh, Rhode Island. And this is a major attack. A thousand colonial forces attack the Narragansett fortified village um, in the Great Swamp. You'll find a lot of these fortifications, um, settlements, Indian settlements in swamps. Uh, it's a great strategy in terms of trying to get in and out. You can attack it from all different sides. You're going to have to go through these narrow corridors to even be able to approach it. Um, the only thing that, well, two things occurred with this one. Um, it was in the 19th of December and the swamp had frozen. And secondly, one of the Narragansetts decided that he was going to, was pissed off at somebody and was going to lead them there. So after um, the force gets to the um, fortified village, uh, they attack it successfully, set the thing on fire, basically burn everybody up. Um, men, women, children, didn't matter. This was a mass slaughter. Um, with heavy, some pretty heavy losses on the English side too, but nowhere near what the Indians were. So the chief for the Narragansett says, well, I'm not going to sit back and take this. He'd set out the war. The Narragansetts had set out the war until then. I think that was enough provocation to sort of bring them in. And, but as I say, the Narragansetts are the largest tribe in southern New England. What are you going to do with four or five thousand Narragansetts now? We'll get to those guys in a minute. Um, at the same time that this is happening in southern New England, Philip and his allies are over in New York, in the upper Hudson, um, trying to get men to join his forces. And by some accounts, he managed to get two to 3,000 more uh, people to join him, fighting men. Uh, a number of them coming down from Canada, other groups in the, in the New York area. Um, and things seemed to be going okay, and then the Mohawk broke it up. And that ended all of that potential reinforcements coming in uh, for Philip. Um, so by February, the Narragansetts had fled from Rhode Island north, up the west side of Narragansett Bay, across central Massachusetts and Connecticut, to the Lancaster area, which is out around Concord and that part of Massachusetts. Lancaster gets attacked in February. Mary Rawlinson, if you remember the captivity tale, Mary Rawlinson, she gets uh, captured there in Lancaster as the wife of the local minister. She and a number of her kids get captured and they, were, they move with that massive Narragansett group into the upper Connecticut Valley, into the Northfield Vernon area. The, what used to be the Squawky Territory, the Sagoki Territory, if you will. Um, and they stayed there all went along in a starvation condition. Um, it was pretty grim. And there's some indication that there was some Mohawk uh, incursions in there, but basically they were starving to death. And um, <coughs> Mary Rawlinson wasn't faring much better. So with the attack of Lancaster, and then there's a, about 12 other towns that within a month are attacked in eastern Massachusetts. The military command in Massachusetts says, we can't protect everybody. So they write this letter to the valley towns here, Northampton, Hadley, Springfield, and say, you need to coalesce. You need to abandon Northampton and move to Hadley. You need to abandon Westfield and move to Springfield. 
Meanwhile, there's already the refugees from Northfield, Deerfield, down here. And the response was basically, we're not doing this. No way are we going to abandon our towns and all of our hard work and everything else uh, and join uh, or merge into these larger or into these settlements that might be able to protect themselves. So the military command says, well, Yes, you're on your own. And then they say, well, no, if we, if we, if we had 150 soldiers and we'll pay for 50 of them, <coughs> uh, I think we could, you know, we could hold out. And so the war council says, okay, you can have 150 soldiers and we're going to put them <coughs> under the command of Captain William Turner. I had to realize that Captain William Turner at the agency of the colony had just spent three and a half years in prison because he's a Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> and we really don't know what his abilities are in terms of or experience were in terms of military experience. Early on he was actually he's registered as a sergeant in a militia company. In was it Roxbury, John? Um, I think it's one of those towns anyway. So the, the assumption is that he might have had some military experience. In fact, he's old enough to have actually had some military experience during the English Civil War, early on. That one. But that's pretty. He'd have to have been in his teens, early twenties. Yeah, he never went to England, so I'm not confident. He was born in England. Anyway. Um, so here's the situation. You're you basically the the military command saying you're essentially on your own. No, you got uh, 150 troops. Well, troops. These people are very young, inexperienced, and in fact, for Turner was here earlier with a with a company that he raised himself. When he was left in charge of the troops in the Connecticut Valley, they stripped him of all his officers and most of his experienced men. These went back east. He got left with something like 29 um, out of his original company of 60. So they were playing games. And the idea was that these guys were to be garrison troops only. This was a defensive operation. Put people in who can load and cock a gun and fire it out a window when your community is going to get attacked. This is not leaving an offensive group of military people behind that could do any damage to the Indians or have had any intention of doing any damage. But the settlers in Hadley and Northampton particularly were really pressing for an offensive action. And we talked a little bit about some of the motivating factors in here, but since the war began in the Connecticut Valley only, we've lost 101 militiamen from eastern Massachusetts. 44 settlers, 5% all the married men in the valley. We don't know how many wounded. Brookfield, Northfield, Deerfield, they're abandoned. Springfield, half burned. You get, you can see what's going on. They got the grain. And the other part of it is fear for the future and revenge for the past. These were somewhere around here. There's something I actually want to read if you can bear with me because I, I think it's better read than me trying to explain it all because there's some detail in it. But I was trying to cover the, the major parts of that. Who actually goes on this engagement to Turner's Falls? And that's what we're heading up to. There's 85 settlers who participate in the Falls fight. There's none of them 
that had not personally witnessed an attack on their community, watched homes and barns burn, helped the wounded recover, contributed to shelter and feed the refugees from towns that no longer stood, and felt the loss of their neighbors dead and buried. A number of personal motivating factors drove these settlers to take the enormous risk they did. For the 45 married men going into combat, this was a particularly risky venture. If they did not return, their widows and approximately 91 young children would have been left fatherless. But married or unmarried, these 85 settlers were all members of extended families that needed protecting. Whether it was John Church, age 17, the eldest son of Edward Church, who had five younger brothers and sisters, or Jaffa Chapin, age 33, who left four children and his wife seven months pregnant, or the older officers, such as Sergeant Joseph Kellogg, age 50, who left his wife and 11 children behind, the youngest being only seven months old. The past losses that close-knit families had sustained were grim reminders of what was at stake. <coughs> Sergeant John Dickinson and his brother Nathaniel Hadley, for example, lost their brother Azariah when he was killed at the Hopewell Swamp Fight. That was that first one we talked about. Uh, as well as their brother Joseph, who had moved to Northfield in 1674 and was killed with Captain Richard Beers on September 4, 1675, leaving a wife and five children ages two to nine. John Miller's father was shot from ambush while riding with Lieutenant Cooper toward the Agawam village near uh, Springfield, October 5th, just before half the settlement was burned to the ground. The Morgan brothers, Isaac and Jonathan, also rode from Springfield with their, uh, where their father, Palathia Morgan, was murdered the previous March. Lieutenant Samuel Holyoke, age 20, and commander of the horse troop from Springfield, had watched his father, Captain uh, Elijah Holyoke, waste away and die during the previous winter after his estate was consumed in flames, and looked on while his uncle, Major John Pynchon, resigned his command as commander-in-chief of the Massachusetts Bay Colony troops in the valley, and had grieved for his teacher, Pentecost Matthews, the only woman slain during the assault on Springfield. Experienced Hind Hinsdale had lost not only his father, but three of his brothers, who were driving ox carts from Deerfield to Hatfield when Lathrop's company was attacked at Muddy Brook. In fact, the slaughter at Muddy Brook had sent shock waves through these communities and the losses ran very deep. The two Wells brothers from Hadley, Jonathan and Thomas, lost their father, Thomas Wells Sr. at Muddy Brook. David Hoyt, John Church, Joseph Stebbins, and John Taylor of Hadley were all related to the Wells family by marriage. William Speed from Northampton, formerly from Deerfield, lost his 15-year-old son at Muddy Brook, and on and on it goes. For staunch Calvinists brought up on the Old Testament, where an eye for an eye was demanded, that these deaths could simply not go uh, unignored. And so a column of 85 settlers and 37 plus garrison soldiers under the command of Captain William Turner rode north from Hatfield on a 22-mile trek to Peskiomskit Falls on the evening of May 18, 1676. What was the nature of the Indian encampment that they attacked? Uh, what was the population there? Good question. And when you get the answer, can you let me know? <laughs> um, I understand. It was know, mostly women and children and old men. Well, I think that's from the Indians' accounts and from a lot of other histories, I think that's pure hogwash. Um, Where's our reference for that? Well, where's your reference? Stephen Williams? Sheldon? Um, Hubbard? The, there's a, there's 
a scout, or there's a, there's a young man who is captive at the falls. And he comes back and he says, they're really unsuspecting. Um, there's no guards out, and that's where that quote comes from. He says, they're, you know, they're mostly old men, women, and children. And that gets put into a letter by the Reverend John Russell, and that gets sent down to Connecticut. Is this is one of the reasons we really ought to move here, and this is the opportunity that presents itself. Well, the other thing that happens in that same letter is that Turner, at the bottom of the letter, along with the military command in Hatfield, says we're not so sure. There's people moving in and out of there all the time. Um, it, it's pretty risky. But more importantly, after the event, we have Indians talking about themselves being at that fight, men. And the fact that they can muster, there's five settlements up there. It's not just one at the falls. There's a settlement on the east bank, the, the one in Riverside. This is the one we, uh, and they talk about the battlefield, and that's the one that's attacked. Um, there's a settlement across the river on the west side, or across the river, on the Turnus Fall side, anyway. There's at least 100 wigwams on Smeed Island. That's reported two weeks after the event because they went out and burned them out. Um, there was a Another settlement at Cheapside, that's where the scouts almost picked them up when they were going north. And there was one more camp upstream from Riverside in an area that's now underwater. I'm going to show you a, what that area used to look like or a conceptual item. And there's still Indians living up in the Northfield Vernon area. So, we have uh, Kananchit's brother. Kananchit was the chief of the Narragansetts. He'd gone back east at that point and actually been captured and killed. But two of his brothers were at the Falls fight. And they testified that when they were attacked, the bullets, the bullets were flying so furiously that they got the hell out of there. He just dropped his musket and swam across the river. So while that's been statement has been picked up on, <clears throat> it's basically the result of a young captive observing what he could wherever he was, but nothing more than that. Um, the Indians after the fight talked about more than 300 being killed. Um, 176 being men, including one um, sachem, chief. So there's a lot of counter testimony to that. But people have picked up on that one statement as if it's, you know, it's sort of gospel. But when you collect a total assemblage of information, it doesn't appear that way at all. That's not to say there weren't old men, women, and children there. There were. I mean, we're talking about refugee families that are starving. They're there at the falls to get fish. Uh, and was the killing indiscriminate? Yes. Everybody got the axe or the sword or the gun. Uh, when they first attacked the community, they just stick their, probably put shot in the muskets, stuck them through the wigwams, and just blasted them. Those that got out, uh, they, they talk about people running over the bank and trying to escape that way. And Hoyo going after them with a sword and forcing them to jump into the falls um, that I'll tell you about. But I think we can talk, we, we're talking about a l very large refugee community. I'm, I'm guessing that there could have been 500 to 1,000 people easily among those five settlements right in that part of the valley. But the thing that, and I think the 
the reason they're focused there, Smead Island, for example, that's where the, <coughs> the, there's a rock dam across the river, uh, a basalt dam. But when the water's low, the river goes through about a 15 foot wide space. And all, if you're looking for shad, just put your nets across there and you got a perfect way to catch fish. In fact, the, while Turner's Falls is one of the best known shad salmon fishing spots on the entire Connecticut River, that's not the only one. There were great salmon um, and shad fishing areas uh, just south of the Vernon Dam, up in the Hinsdale Vernon North, Northfield area. There's another set of rapids just downstream from the Millers River that was also, and I think that's probably where one of the, one of the other communities were. So there were a lot of people there. And um, the, the other thing too is if, and this is being really kind of facetious, but if they're all old men, women, and children, who chased the English all the way back to Deerfield and killed the whole mess of them if it wasn't the men who were somehow hiding out? You know, it just, it, it just doesn't make sense. But it's been latched onto, and you'll hear it more than once. Um, I, I have a probably very stupid question. Let's <coughs> say there were many young men, it was a very large refugee community, fine. When we say that there was an opportunity that presented itself, what was it an opportunity for? The opposite, to kill for revenge. For, for preventing the future from happening? Yes, both. I mean, the, the, as far as the military, as, as far as the settlers and the military could figure out, what was going to happen as soon as the Indians got in a large supply of fish, they were going to start attacking again. And they were sitting ducks. They couldn't, they couldn't count on the, on the military forces coming in from Eastern Mass anymore. They told them, we're, we're, we're going to protect these towns out here. We're out of here. Northampton got attacked in March, uh, a couple months before this. They actually breached three places in the Palisade Wall around Northampton, killed five people. What the Indians didn't realize is that two companies of troops had just arrived the night before and it caught them off guard. And really caught them off guard because there was when they got into the walls and started spreading out, and then they realized there was all these troops in there, they couldn't get back out of the walls because they'd gone through some narrow spaces in the wall. But nonetheless, the, they were gonna get, and I, I think ultimately for the, for the Indian side, it was to wipe out all the English settlements in the valley and basically become a refugee area for not only the people, some of the, people that had originally lived here, but for Indians coming in from Eastern Mass, because they were just getting slaughtered in the East. So, Excuse me. Yes. what was the catalyst to bring these tribes together to initially cause the attack in Plymouth? There wasn't one thing. Um, it started out in a, a fracas with some young warriors getting into a fight with one farmer in Southern Plymouth, and it went from there. Um, I think different communities had different reasons for joining. Some, like the one in Northampton, may not have felt that they had any choice. If they were going to have to give up their guns, they couldn't defend themselves against from the English if they attacked, but they couldn't defend themselves from the Indians who wanted them to join their group if they decided not to. And apparently Philip had been out here in the valley the, the spring before with lots of wampum trying to pay off of, by forces, by men. And that's, that was fairly typical uh, for the general period. Um, so this is basically the route that they would have followed out of Hatfield. At least 123 
to 150 some odd men. Horseback, riding in the dead of night over footpaths. Coming in, surprised this community up here. I can't remember the sequence of the slides, but okay. This I'm going to show you Turner's Falls as most of us have thought about it, and the, the idea of the falls. This is an 18 18 lithograph, but the falls. This the reason there's a falls in this river here is that there's a dam underneath it. The first dam here at Turner's Falls was put in in 1795. There is no photograph of this river without a dam. There's no painting of this river without a dam. So when we talk about falls, this is what people typically think about. And so when you read in the stories about the Indians going over the falls, this is what you kind of think about. They went in, they, the riverside's over here. This is where Turner's Falls is today. Uh, the river comes down and then takes a bend to the south over that way. So, with a lot of help from some friends. Oh, and this is a this is a picture of the river at low water in the 1930s. Riverside is in here. You can see this is all Barton's Cove up in here. The river actually comes down over behind this peninsula wraps around and comes down through here, goes down over the falls. This is only one of five different dams that have existed here. Goes down through here and then takes a bend to the south. Oops. This is basically based on a lot of historical accounts and map work and a few other things. Is this is what it roughly looked like. Um, this is Riverside, and that's Barton's Cove today, but without the dam, it was high and dry. And the falls, rather than being a falls down here where the dam is, and this is all still water, there's actually a flume that ran down through here that during low water took most of the water in the river. It was just raging down through this narrow gorge. And higher up on the bedrock, you get a series of bedrock, drops in the bedrock, series of rapids and mini falls down through here uh, at higher water. Um, and when the English attacked from this direction, the camps were spread out, I believe, in this area, but probably also further on down through here. If you look at this picture, there's no way, for example, in the descriptions they talk about people trying to get away from the English attack by putting their canoes in the water and trying to paddle across the river. There's no way they're going in here. Um, there's a natural bedrock bench just below this bank of the river. This is mostly fill today, it doesn't exist. And this flume no longer exists, it's totally filled in. But some of the Indians jumped over here, tried to hide under this bank, and the English went after them. So they jump into here, and just get broken up as they go down through the falls. Um, so you have accounts of Indians coming in from here, the, one of the things that you pick up from um, Jonathan Wells is he was one of 20 men who was a rear, uh, left behind for rear guard action. Somehow they were up in here trying to keep the canoes from coming across the river over here. And um, his feeling was we stayed far too long. They began to come this way, they began to come across the river, they started to appear from over here, and they barely got out um, back to their horses, which were up in here somewhere. 
um, and finally joined the retreat from the falls. But when attacking, there was one Englishman killed and one wounded. The one killed was shot by his own men coming out of a wigwam, um, and the other one was wounded. But by the time they got back to Hatfield, they lost 38. Uh, the Indians came at them from Cheapside, from the islands down here, from this side of the river, and from coming down through here. And just when they got up and over Fall River, which is down in here, up past Canada Hill and out towards White Ash Swamp and off to the south. Let me see if I can probably back this up just a bit. Yeah. They basically left the same way they, they went, but the Fall River is right about in there and then they cross up through Stoney Burnham and then do this loop around. There's a uh, recreation area on Nash, I think it's Nash Brook, in Greenfield. That's where Captain Turner was killed, right in, around in there. But they chased them all the way back to the bars. And then Jonathan Wells got left behind somewhere up in there. For two days he wandered up this valley and back down this valley and finally picked up the trail here, came back through Deerfield, uh, followed the trail down, got to Muddy Brook, found a skull resting in the path from one of the soldiers that had been killed the previous September. And supposedly took the time to rebury it. Um, <clears throat> But I don't think he's going to forget that spot, uh, you know, where, where that sort of happened. And then gradually, by sun, uh, Sunday, I think, makes it back to the half year. So, just in conclusion, then, a little bit of a summary. So by nightfall on May, 8, or May 19th, this is the night after the attack, Turner and 23 of the 37 garrison soldiers under his command are dead, one's wounded. 85 settlers, 15 had also been killed, two were wounded, and at least two others, the chaplain, Hope Atherton from Hatfield, and the second in command, Lieutenant Samuel Holyoke of Springfield, who was a 20-year-old captain appointed captain because he was the grandson of William Pynchon, not because he had any military experience, evidently died from post-traumatic shock, deep depression, and possibly suicide within the year. Some 300 men, women, and children from various Indian communities have been shot or drowned at Peskyomska. Later on, when Jonathan Wells uh, was talking to Indians that had participated in that falls fight, they said easily 300, there could have been more. It's just that there were so many different communities at the falls that they really didn't know one another uh, to be able to keep track enough to know who was missing. Uh, let's see. At the time, Increase Mather, uh, who was a minister in, in Eastern Massachusetts, viewed the great and notable slaughter as a victory and clear evidence of the hand of God. <laughs> By the 19th century, this onslaught was known as the Turner's Falls Massacre. Well, the war dragged on for the next two months in the valley and came to a virtual end in August of 1676 with the death of Philip and surrender of the Narragansetts, Wampanoags, and Nipmucks. Those that remained from the Connecticut Valley Indian villages primarily fled north and west but over the next hundred years, their incursions into northern New England during four English and French colonial wars kept their memory alive, and the English settlers here in the valley and in such hill towns as Conway in a state of constant apprehension until the Treaty of Paris in 1763. So there you go.